Thanks, everyone. Uh, I hope you've all had a nice beverage, getting a little bit more perked up after, now in the afternoon, especially as I'm coming in here to talk to you about the tech equivalent of let's eat your veggies and remember working out is important for you. So, but why am I here and why would I want to talk about this? Well, I spend a lot of my time thinking about how do we deal with stuff getting code into production and how to iterate on it when it actually gets there. Having a good test suite is what actually allows me to deal with production, get there quicker and make sure that I can feel fairly confident that things are working. But I have worked on <coughs> a couple of test suites uh, that I've helped build, maintain and taken over that I was kind of cursing its existence rather than thanking it for helping save my bacon. So, and I'm sure a fair amount of you have been doing that. So, for example, I, have you ever been in a situation where you have read a lot of tests and you can't really tell what's going on? Uh, have you made a single change in logic and it kind of snowballed? You're now updating all of the places where this logic was touched because now it's going to have to be used again. Or did you have to tweak that mock so that it returned exactly that value because the business logic needed to change so all the tests went through. All of these are kind of painful and the test suite that you love should make these changes easy to do uh, or simple to do but it takes some practice, a lot of intention and uh, we'll get to do that by um, uh, and we're going to get to that and we're going to be doing that by reviewing some of the tests and get a, f a couple of tests that we've written here and get a feel for what they're doing. Uh, we're going to be refactoring these tests according to a couple of constraints we'll talk about and we'll be walking through this step by step. To understand what we're doing, we're going to be do doing a domain of a calculator. So imagine that you're a point of sale system, you are in a grocery store and you're trying to buy something and you're just going to figure out how much am I supposed to pay. So let's start by reviewing our test cases. So here we have a zero, a starting test case. This, uh, I have nothing in my cart. I want to figure out how much, how much it's going to cost me. Hopefully it's going to cost me zero dollars because I haven't bought anything yet. So next up, we have more of a normal case. I am trying to buy an overpriced banana. And let's talk through what we have here. So we have a, pr we have a name of the, the thing. This is what's going to go on to the receipt. Uh, we're also going to be using this as a primary key because this is a talk and not a real production decode. Um, we have how many we're trying to buy in the quantity. So in this case, we're buying one banana. We have a tax rate because we also need to make sure that uh, the government gets a little bit of a cut of whatever we're doing. And we are paying something for it. In this case, we're paying one. Let's assume it's a dollar. And this is an inclusive tax price because this, the 12% has already been added onto this. So the total for all of this is one dollar and a tax amount of 10 cents and, and uh, 71. So let's look over a couple of more test cases. So that was fairly straightforward. So here's another one. It's something about quantity not being one. So we can see that doubling the quantity is supposed to change, double our values. Sounds fair enough. Okay, so here we have invalid bananas. I'm not entirely sure how bananas get invalid, but here we are. So we see that the tax rate is 66%. It doesn't sound very fun, but why is that invalid? Like, and we can see that we expect an error. Okay. Um, but why am I expecting an error and why is 66% invalid? Like, it could be a fair price. And let's, but, but let's continue, let's go through. So now we're looking at another case. Here we have something, um, a ripe banana and it's having a discount on it. So that's the name, has a price, but our totals are different. So why are the totals different? There's nothing in this test that tells me why this, this price shouldn't be the same as the previous one. So how does it all come together? So let's step back a little bit and uh, look at, uh, like think about what we're seeing in these tests. So I think there are a couple of things that are kind of going through here and uh, first off, we have magic values. Why is it that 66% is off? Uh, what, how do I know what is valid? And why is that ripe banana 20% 20, 20 cheaper? I'm also noticing that a couple of these fields don't seem to be used in every test case. Uh, that, that feels a little bit off to me because this is also a pattern that now means that if I ever want to do something else that's a little bit different, I can just add another field. And then you do that for a couple of months and all of a sudden you have 50 fields on this thing and you have a really rough time figuring out what's going on. So let's try to do something about that. 
So let's start by looking at our code, because that's a good place to start. So this is our test body. This is the one that's within the t.run. So we have a couple of things. It's not that big, it's not that bad, but here we have, like, okay, so we have our tax rates. Uh, we can see that the 66% is not in there, so that's probably why it's invalid. I'm not gonna look at the code, but I'll just make some assumptions, because that's what we do. Um, we can see here that we have a discount rule, and apparently a ripe banana gives a 20% discount. Cool, so now we have an answer to that question. Oh, ooh, um, if statements. If statements in your test, uh, this is not a good thing. Now, you're also not just, not just dealing with which one of these fields am I supposed to use, you also don't know when they're being called. If I added my total amount into this together with, with the error, the total amount would never be checked. So, not great. And on top of that, I'm also noticing that all of these things are called directly. So that implies that this is all happening in the current package we're in. And I think we should be using the test package because there are definitely some advantages to that. So let's start looking at some refactorings. And what I want to do for this is that I'd like to move uh, all of our tests into a test package to be so we were intentional about our public interfaces. Uh, we shouldn't be poking our privacy, so we tend to leak internals when we do that. Um, I also want to remove any if statements that so we're using the same field and, and everywhere and we're very intentional about what our tests are about. And then I want to highlight the important setup to make it clear that we discount ripe bananas or that an invalid tax rate is one we don't know about. So let's start with test package. So here is the code, a little bit abbreviated. We removed a couple of lines from this file. But we have this package here. We're going to go through and we're changing it. We're now in the test package. This code is now invalid because we can no longer call it. So let's go and change that. So now we're import the cart package and we are using cart static tax rates and all of that. So what's the point of all of this? Well, now we can only test public interfaces. We have made an explicit design decision that this is the way we deal with our test, which means that we should be thinking about what are the things that we're actually turning into public and what are the things we can just not talk about. Because it's sometimes nice to be able to just keep stuff on your own. Um, we have also kind of implied that we're making a decision that our tests are about the behavior and not the implementation, or rather this is what we always should be doing. And one of the good things of keeping it in the test package is because it's much easier to fall into a trap where you're testing your implementation if you get access to everything. If you can only access the stuff that uh, every, anyone else can do, it's much harder to mess with that. And you shouldn't make everything public by default. And the reason for that is because private stuff are implementation details. You shouldn't have to pay attention to them unless, uh, especially not for the test, because they're not there for that. That said, sometimes you need to do something to make sure that you get access or you can test some really big pieces that no one else should do. And in Go, we have this nice internal package. You can make one of those, put them in there. I know this is a bit of a contentious one, but they're nice, use them. They, they can help you. And uh, from there, we have now moved our test package. Uh, we have something there. Let's start looking at our if statements. So this is what we got in a test. And let's start by changing the expect error. I'd like that to, instead of being a true, uh, I'd like it to be something that we can actually pass in and tell me, do this instead. So let's introduce a change. So we're turning this into a function. So we're taking in the error and we're making a decision within the test setup itself. This is what it means to me to, for this to be a failing test or when I expect an error. And uh, then let's change our test body to use this properly. And uh, right. Um, okay, so we didn't remove the if statement yet. We've just made it so that if we have expect error and it's not, and it's not nil, we'll then use it. And the reason for that is because we can't just remove the if statement because then all of this code would start running with the first one and we know that that wouldn't pass because that's what has been written here. So we're also going to have to deal with this one. We're going to have to make sure that the actual assertions we're making on the object also gets taken care of. So let's go through that change. So here's our code again. Let's add, add another expectation. We are now checking the results. In this case, we're dealing with the invalid tax rate and we expect an empty object back. And, uh, right, okay, so we still have if, if statements. We're not really improving yet. Uh, is that okay? And yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
when we're refactoring, we're taking many small steps. We're just trying to make sure that we don't break the things we have. And it's fine that things get a little bit messier because at least it's easy. I'm moving forward. I'm seeing I'm making progress. So we have to trust in our refactors. We spend a little bit of time, and we practice. So let's take it up a level. Uh, let's make both of these, these uh, required, expect error and expect result. And let's introduce some default helpers to make this a little bit more expressive, what it is that we're trying to say. So these are my two helpers. I have no error to just help me say that there are no errors in here. Um, it will make a little bit more sense in a bit. And then totals here is just making sure that I can give it a total amount and a total tax amount. It will bake that into a, uh, bake that into a function and make a closure out of it. And then you can call that within it. And then that way, we can work with it. And the way that kind of works out, we put it in, we replace it, and there we go. So we expect no errors, and we expect the result to have a total of 0, 0. Let's repeat that across all of our test cases. And now we have updated all of our test cases. I didn't feel like you had to go through that. Um, now we can start doing with this. We don't need those if statements anymore. And now we clean that up. Look, ma, no ifs. That is an improvement that I like to see. So we got some good changes getting, the, getting rid of those if statements. It gets a bit hairy, but that's what refactorings are kind of all about. And it got better at the end. So let's look at a little bit about highlighting the important parts of what we're actually doing. So this is the stuff that we are, this is the current test that we have, or the test body. And there's a lot of stuff in here that I would rather just take away and make it so that I can configure it and tell me that discount for ripe banana is only for ripe banana in the test case, or that these are the tax rates we're dealing with. So let's make that in some configuration. Oop. And remove some code. And now we have a straightforward test body. But that also means we now have to go and change and create some helpers to deal with that. So I have now named that these tax rates, which was just a list before. It turns out these are actually Swedish tax rates, because that's where I'm from, so hello. And uh, we also have no discounts. So now I can update that. And I get a nice little clarification here that we're dealing with uh, tax rates from Sweden. And there are currently no discounts on this. So when we sum it up, it all kind of works out this way. So now if we go back and we look at the tax rates uh, test case that was making something different, this is the way it would look like. We can just create an uh, anonymous function at the call site, and then we pass in what, it, what value we want to do. So uh, let's, let's zoom out a little bit and just think a bit about our test cases. So our tests are now explicitly declaring what they're doing. And it's obvious what's going to be different when they're requiring. But there's a lot of boilerplate. And, and if we were to add another collaborator on this calculator, I'd have to update every test to make sure that they actually know what's going on. I, I don't really like that. I'd like it so that I can add something that doesn't really affect the test I'm currently running. It should just stay there. Because no one likes it when your line count implodes, unless your manager counts how many lines of code you changed in a month. Don't do that. So what can we do? Well, we're dealing with the calculators. So let's look at how we create calculators. So this is the standard pattern that we are having going on here. We create a new calculator. We pass in some objects. We get back, back the thing. We're working with it. For the test cases, I'd like this to be a little bit, uh, I, I, this would work. You could definitely work with this. But I think it's a bit verbose. And it would very quickly become a thing that I wouldn't really want to do. So let's explore some options to make this a little bit more dynamic. And what I would like to do is have some kind of default, which I can then override. So let's look at the builder. So a builder pattern is where you, you have something. You can then modify whatever is going on inside. And you can type in something, usually build, and it will give you back the object. And you can modify it throughout. Um, it's not the only pattern. Another one that's fairly common within Go, I, it's kind of the options pattern. It's the thing you will often see like AWS SDKs and all over the place where this is how you say that this thing should be able to be changed. And the difference here is more, it's just a function. It takes in a list of functions, and it, it changes uh, whatever thing it is, and returns back the thing that you're configuring. Uh, I end up using both of these. It kind of just depends on the situation. I, I've started preferring the builder when it's more complex. It gives me nice, uh, like I use period, and it just pops up in my editor. I can deal with it. But in this case, I'm, I'm going to pick the options version because it's slightly less typing. And why would I type more than I have to? So let's look at how that's implemented. 
So this is my default calculator we were just looking at. So what this is doing is that it's uh, creating this uh, default. It, it works together with a name struct that host, houses all of my collaborators, and it looks like this. And uh, the type of this object is nothing special. It's just all my things. And then the reason I need to have that object is because I need to work together with someone. I need to be able to change it. So I'm passing in, I'm taking a function, you, giving it this, uh, a pointer to this, so it can be modified. And uh, that's the way it's kind of working. So let's uh, check how we're actually calling this thing. So this is default calculator again with the tax rates, Swedish tax rates, and now it's being set. So the way we implement this is that we have our, uh, we have our builder here. Uh, rather, this is our option function. So what it does is that it takes in an argument uh, of a tax rate. It then returns a function that has um, direct access to the calculate, calculator option builder, and then it sets its value there. Um, this, is a, there's, this is a fairly common pattern. If you'd like to learn more about it, there's a great blog post by Rob Pike, and I also have a link at the end of the presentation, so I'll, that's also available. And so with that, we've now gone through, created default calculators and default values. It's easier to work with. I can just use that instead of passing everything. I'm still going to require the default calculator everywhere because I would rather that you are explicit that this is the thing I'm doing because that way we're not optional. All the fields are always required, but we keep the required fields at the minimum. Um, so we made it so our tests don't have to change if we get another collaborator and uh, we can keep all of this contained. And I'm happy with how we refactor the test. And uh, there's something that's kind of nagging me still about how all of this comes together. What we're doing works, but I'm collaborating with two different types of objects that I haven't really looked at yet. So what are these collaborations and how are they coming together? So let's have a look. So this is fairly regular Go code. It's a bit bigger than I'm usually comfortable with, but you know, to each his own. And uh, I, I can kind of glean there are a couple of different things going on here. Like this, definitely some violation of the single responsibility principle in my mind, or the Unix philosophy if you're more of a Cupid person. So first off, we're trying to apply discounts to line items. So we're going over all of the line items and we're applying a discount to them. And afterwards, we're doing calculations. We're figuring out the total amount and then we're figuring out what the tax on that is and then we're summing them together. And then finally, we return all of that. So this is quite a bit of stuff and I'm seeing a couple of things that have been very easy to write. I can definitely imagine that this happened over time. This is very natural code. But it kind of left us with an, a thin and anemic domain, and there's really no expressiveness in our objects. And I would rather have a bit more expressiveness in my objects than put every piece of logic in one place, because I can definitely see this in half a year being a very, very, very big function. And uh, I'd rather not have that. So let's explore some changes and see what we can do. So I have dubbed this like don't mix collaboration and business logic, because that's kind of the idea of what we're trying to do, to focus on one thing. So this is going to force us to break this up into more pieces. So there are going to be more objects and more individual tests, but they're all going to do fewer things. And uh, this is going to be one of the harder things that we're looking for today. And honestly, this constraint can be a bit annoying. Um, it's kind of freeing when you get to it and you get around to it because it does allow you, but it's maybe not where you start every time. But this is kind of the, if you TDD and you write your test first, that's a very freeing thing when, you, when it clicks for you. This is the same thing. When this stuff click, it really, really helps you. And so let's start looking at our calculator. Um, some things that have stood out from all of this is that we're calculating the line item total, we're taking discount into account. Why isn't the, this, the line item doing that itself? And we're talking with this tax, rate, tax rates object to figure out the value for the line items so we do a calculation. And the reason for that is because the tax rate we have is a primitive and it doesn't understand and have all the information it needs to calculate. So that also feels a little bit iffy. So let's write those tests, shift some responsibilities around, and um, yeah, I'd go for that. So this is, um, this is the first test we're going to do. We're going to be looking at how to do the price calculations. So this is pretty much the same as we ought to be kind of looking for. And, uh, this is the test runner itself, so it's very straightforward. And this is the logic. 
which we just copied straight off from the calculator. So let's go back into calculate and use it. And that's a, lot, a little bit less code, and the thing, the, gr the thing is growing a little bit more. Our domain is growing. It's getting more understanding what we're up to. So let's make a tax rate object to find the real tax rate and attach it to the line items so it can work on its own. So the, one, the thing I want to do here is to make my line item always have a valid tax rate. So line item contains all the information it needs to calculate the taxable amount. As a line item, understanding how much it costs is reasonable. So taking this code and turning it into something like this. So let's start by changing some definitions and adding the calculation. So with a tax rate struct and introduce it. Uh, as always, we start with some test, introduce a new tech cart tax rate struct, and it only contains those values right now. They add and remove. Oops, sorry, I forgot to add a little pink outline there. Uh, so let's look at how all of this has been implemented. So this is our test again, and this is the calculation. We take the total price that we already had, and then we take the tax rate and we remove a certain amount. And the reason here we do the, use the remove is because if you've added 12% and your out price is $1, if you remove 12%, you'll now remove more money than you're supposed to. So you don't want to give mo the government more money than they should. So just make sure you use the right tax rates, and that's why we're doing all of this work. So with that, let's go back to our calculator and uh, use our new implementation. Uh, it looks a lot nicer. Maybe let's do something about those assignments. And that looks better. Um, and as you've probably figured out, all of this re required some changes so to our old test to keep passing. So let's quickly go over that. Right, so we have our new ta food ra tax rate, so we need to deal with that. Turns out, 12% meant food. That's what uh, the tax rate for food in Sweden is if you're taking it away. Uh, so then I went and updated our various bananas. And uh, as I was able to remove the test for checking, uh, Oops, sorry. So then I went and updated our various bananas. And as I was able to remove the test for checking if we had any errors, because we always require a valid tax rate on our line items now, I was also able to remove some code. And the best code you have is the one you didn't have to write, right? Or the one you were able to delete. So where does all this leave us? We have some objects to work with. Uh, I really would like to dig in more into making sure we're not iterating inside of the calculate. But in the traditional programming books everywhere, this is left as an exercise for you. So please come along and let's talk about this afterward. I have my laptop with me. Uh, the, the hint for this is it's time to use mocks and just check that we're being called and not checking the exact return values. Because right now, the problem with this test suite as it stands is that it, you're, you're replicating the test at multiple layers to see that things are working. This is not very nice and it's going to be one of those things that comes back in a couple of months and you're going to hate yourself or the test suite, rather. So what have we been looking at? We walked through a couple of refactors. And with them, we talked about a couple of constraints to make your test suite look nicer. So namely, you should write tests are in the test package, because you're then being intentional about, about your interface and stay away from the internals. You, should have, you shouldn't have if statements in your test body, and you should not have optional fields in the test setup. Make sure that you're using everything you're putting in there. Uh, if you don't do this, your tests quickly get hard to follow. So instead, focus on making it configurable and obvious what you want in each test case. Then may highlight the differences between the test cases. Um, you're going to be scrolling through a couple of these. They're all going to be a little bit, oh, but they're kind of samey. Let's make them not samey. Make it clear when you're making a difference. And uh, name what you're doing and create helpers to show it. So 12% could have been tax rate food. And uh, then uh, when we started, we had a one object that was responsible for a lot of different things. Uh, when we ended, it was only collaborating with a couple of objects and then returning the combination of their work. So try and don't, don't mix business logic and collaboration. Um, trying to live up to this refactor, we ended up growing our domain to be more intentional. And we even managed to remove an error check by changing definitions. So that's also quite nice because We've now said that this is what valid looks like. That problem still remains and has to be somewhere, but it's coming. And a good sign that you are probably mixing is that uh, you have many test cases. Keep, a number of, uh, keep the number of test cases per method or function kind of small, and you're going to avoid that. And finally, something that I'd encourage all of you to do is don't copy-paste when you're writing stuff. Like, feel the pain of typing. 
The, the, this, is the, this is the trigger. If you're trying to build a habit, you need to find a trigger. This is the one. Use this, make sure that you actually start thinking about, could I name this instead? Could I make this nicer to reuse? Could I make it so that I can just kind of follow through? So type it out. Uh, use that expensive uh, mechanical keyboard. Or justify it, because you're not typing more. So we went through a couple of different strategies for doing this. So we made a couple of named helpers to help us out. So that, that was kind of the thing that helped us with the statements. Uh, we, we used to have these pure values. Now we have no errors, tax rate food, Swedish tax rates, and so on. Um, we have introduced different versions of the strategy pattern to provide unique places where you can say, call me like this, do this thing for me. And that has really helped ma made us clear for us. And we have use objects uh, or object creators or builders to help make it super nice to showcase what you're working on, show the thing that you're actually up to. Uh, it, hel it really helps highlighting the differences as well, and you're working with the assumption that, and you're working with an assumption of what you have and can call out what you want to change. So create the faults, create, make it so you can override in them, and it will be much easier and clearer what your test is really trying to do. So. With that, thank you. Uh, I hope I have given you some ideas for explore how to make your test suite something you'd like to maintain. And I'll make sure that this slide is part of their website as soon as possible. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, let me check if there are any questions. OK, yeah, we just got one. Maybe I have Okay, how would you recommend if the test target for different environment? If not using if statement, what would you recommend pass environment specific variables? So this is kind of, I think this was covered. It's figure out what it is that you vary by, make sure you pass that in, make it configurable in some way and deal with it. Just highlight it. That, that would be my recommendation. If you'd like to discuss this a bit further because we are out on time here, please look, look me up and uh, let's talk. Thank you. Right, thanks everyone.